And so before we got into our prayer meeting, or actually during our prayer meeting, James actually had a prophetic word for me. And he was saying that he saw me arriving, and I was like the older sister <laughs> that was coming, and the little siblings are all around me. Oh my gosh, what news has she got of the father? And I was running up the stairs, and my siblings were following me to hear what, what did the father say to the older sibling? And what news can she give us? And I thought it was actually really funny. And thank you, James, that you didn't call me the mother, but the older sister. I'll take that. (laughs) But it's interesting because I think if I had to come up with a title for tonight's preach, it would be My Sealing Your Floor. And so tonight I want to look a bit at the prophetic. But specifically, I want to look at prophetic acts. Because we all, if you've been in church for a while, especially charismatic church, we're all pretty comfortable with prophetic words. We're quite comfortable giving prophetic words. We're quite comfortable receiving prophetic words. It actually, it's nice. It's nice. It's encouraging. But when it comes to prophetic acts, it gets a little bit weird. It gets a little bit uncomfortable. There are times and moments where we will maybe see someone do something as a prophetic act and it makes us just, what are they doing? Instantly, you feel uncomfortable. And believe me, guys, I've been in church meetings where I've seen some prophetic acts where I'm like, I hope you're hearing from God because this is now just weird. But the thing is, there's a history about really, really weird prophetic acts. And thank goodness for that. And so, I love looking at the old prophets and just some of the prophetic acts they did. And so I want to go first to prophet Ezekiel. And before I actually go into Ezekiel, I actually want to honor Ezekiel. And it's funny when Sune was feeling that there was a thankfulness. At that moment, I actually was just going over my notes in my head, and I was like, I actually am so thankful for Prophet Ezekiel. I'm so thankful that his prophetic acts, his obedience to God, is my foundation. I'm so thankful that because he put his things aside to be obedient to God, I can walk in greater things. This is my history because I've been grafted into a new family. This is not just the Bible. This is not just a book that we get to read. This is our history. This is our story. These are people that have done things and gone before us so we can walk in greater things at the moment. And so if you can go to Ezekiel 4. Guys, Ezekiel is hectic. Okay, so it says, Now, son of man, take a block of clay, put it in front of you, And draw the city of Jerusalem on it. Then lay siege to it. Erect siege works against it. Build a ramp up it. Set up camps against it. And put battling rams around it. Then take an iron pan. Place it as an iron wall between you and the city. And turn your face towards it. It will be under siege and you shall besiege it. This will be a sign to the people of Israel. Then... Lie on your left side and put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. I have assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. So for 390 days, you will bear the sin of the people of Israel. After you have finished this, not like that was already enough, But after you have finished this, lie down again, this time on your right side, 
and bear the sin of the people of Judah. I have assigned you 40 days, a day for each year. Turn your face towards the siege of Jerusalem and with a barred arm prophesy against her. I will tie you up with robes so that you cannot turn from one side to the other, just in case it gets a bit sore, hey guys. So I'm going to tie you up so you can just lie there. So you cannot turn from one side to the other until you have finished the days of your siege. Take wheat and barley, beans and lentils, millet and spelt, put them in a storage jar and use them to make bread for yourself. You are to eat it during the 390 days, only that, while you lie on your side. Weigh out 20 shekels of food to eat each day and eat it at set times. Also, measure out a sixth of a hen of water and drink it at set times. Eat the food as you would, a loaf of barley bread. Bake it in the sight of the people using human feces. For fuel. The Lord said, in this way, the people of Israel will eat defiled food among the nations where I will drive them. Then I said... So this is now where Ezekiel has a problem, right? The fact that he's lying for more than a year on his side, is not, that's not bad enough. He's like, you're crossing a line here now. And then I said, no, 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 sovereign Lord. I have never defiled myself. From my youth until now, I have never eaten anything found dead or torn by wild animals. No impure meat has ever entered my mouth. Very well, he said, I will let you bake your bread on cow dung instead of human feces. What a compromise. Let's logically think about this moment. God is telling this man to go and lie on his side with a little miniature replica of the city in front of him. Put an iron pan. Guys, do you know what that looked like? If you had to walk in here, and one of us is lying on our sides with a miniature replica of Hillcrest. There's a pan in front of us. We're busy cooking our food on our own feces. And we're like, it's all good, guys. It's all good. God told me to do this. I will think you are crazy. I will think, did you double check with someone before you did that? I would be, maybe you need a second opinion. Maybe you didn't hear God. But thank goodness that we have people like Ezekiel, who's not the only prophet that has done some very interesting things that will make me question, did you hear God? Thank goodness we have people like Ezekiel who is obedient to act. Let me tell you something. It is a lot easier to give someone a prophetic word than to do a prophetic act. You question yourself. You go through that mindset of, did God really say that? Did God really, am I really hearing him in this moment? Because I am going to look so silly when I do something. But then there's that moment where you do something that feels so absolutely ridiculous. And it brings breakthrough. It brings freedom. It brings deliverance. Your small act of obedience to what Holy Spirit says. And so over the last year or so, Holy Spirit has really been stirring Graham and myself about doing more prophetic acts. And so if you've been around church and you've been to one of our Jesus evenings, our Jesus festivals, you would have experienced some of the things that we have prophetically been doing. And so one of the things I wanted to look at was our last evening we had. So Holy Spirit started speaking to us about uncapping the wells. 
And at first, when he started speaking to us about uncapping the prophetic wells, not just in Hillcrest, but in Durban, and specific areas where he gave us clear direction where to go, we thought, this is crazy. We honestly thought, what on earth? Then Holy Spirit said to me, I want you to take a bucket. And I want you to fill it with as many stones as you can. And as you do this prophetic act of removing the stones out of this bucket, you are busy prophetically uncapping the wells in people's lives, in the city, in schools, in the nation. Guys, it seemed a bit silly. Here I am lugging these stones in my car for weeks. All your years, it literally broke open the bag and went all over my car where we are still finding some stones under the seats. Every time I hit the brakes, I hear these stones, and I'm like, Holy Spirit, I am just being obedient right now. Then I'm like, okay, I'm going to be really clever, and I'm going to half fill the bucket, and Holy Spirit's like, you need to fill the bucket of stones. And so tonight when we were arriving and I was walking, I actually found the stone on the path. And it's exactly the stones that... We did that night, and that was a couple of weeks ago. So he's into the detail. So he gave us Genesis 26. So let's go there. Are we good? Don't you just love the word? Genesis 26 from about verse... 18. So Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died. And he gave them the same names his father had given them. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herders of Gerar quarreled with those of Isaac and said, The water is ours. So he named the well Isaac, because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also, so he named it Sitna. He moved on from there and dug another well, and no one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth, saying, Now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. From there he went up to Beersheba. That night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. There he pitched his tent and then his servants dug another well. What was really important as we started going through this journey of uncapping the wells or just redigging the wells, what is so beautiful about this scripture and what Holy Spirit has been speaking to me about is they didn't go and dig new wells. They actually went and dug up their father's wells. There was something so important of Isaac honoring what his father did and what he could walk in. So it wasn't, I'm going to go do a new thing right now. It was, I'm going to reopen what my father did. And so as he went to dig up those wells, he even goes as far as to name it the same names his father did. Because you see, there's this trap at the moment where every generation feels like they need to do a new thing to make a name for their generation. We are the ones that are going to usher in revival. We are the ones that's going to do a new thing in worship. We are the generation that's going to do something new. We, what it actually is, is we are going to build on top of what the next generation, the previous generation did. That is their ceiling. It is my floor. What those have done before me, I'm not going to throw that away and say that worked for that generation. No, I'm going to honor, I'm going to respect 
the time, the energy, the prayers, the fasting, the propheticness, the acts that we don't even know of, that that generation went through, that I had no idea of. Thank you for praying for hours. Thank you for fasting over situations that I just freely can walk in right now because of what they have done for us. It's not about the new greatest thing. It's about how can we build on what they have already started. We just had Freedom Day. And Graham shared this morning a bit about Freedom Day. And I'm embarrassed to say that I was that person that looked at Graham and was like, what is it about? In a prayer meeting about Freedom Day. That was me. (laughs) So 29 years ago, I was 11 years old. All I was interested in was boys having a bubble dress and having plastic shoes. That is all I cared about. All I cared about when I was 11. How many boys like me? How many boys can I date? (laughs) And am I so cute in my plastic shoes? Which is very uncomfortable and sweaty. It wasn't great shoes. But that's all I could think about when I was 11. So when all that political stuff was going on, I was oblivious to it. I had no idea what was actually happening around me. I was just 11 years old. And over this last couple of days, Graham and I have actually, well, I needed to be educated, guys, because I felt actually embarrassed that I just saw Freedom Day as like, I get to have a bride. (laughs) I get to not work. I get to rest. Yay for another public holiday. But when my (laughs) very wise husband said there was more to it than just a public holiday, I started doing some research. And we were really honored to be at this prayer meeting on Thursday where there was intercessors and very key people that were part of the negotiations and the prophetic acts and the prayer that went into my freedom that I now so freely walk in. That I didn't even have any idea what life was like around me when I was just oblivious to what was going on around me. And I sat there as these people got up on the podium praying And saying, oh, we can see the freedom. We can see what we are walking in now. That happened 29 years ago. Our prayers worked. Our intercession worked. Us being crazy and erecting ourselves over the parliament building so we can pray day and night, day and night. I moved my office so that I can just be there, so I can pray over the government buildings. These people went through extremes to be part of my freedom today. And when I so embarrassingly realized that I actually did not even know what took place when I was 11 years old, I was like, do my kids know what this day represent? Have I failed even my children to educate them of the importance of our country's history? Sure, you learn little bits and snippets in school, but let me tell you, They're not going to teach you about the prophetic stuff that went on. They're not going to teach you about the relentless fasting and praying that went into that time. The prophetic acts that went into our freedom. They're not going to teach that in school. It's our responsibility to teach them what freedom really looks like and the cost of that freedom. It costs something. People gave of themselves so we can have a holiday and just enjoy it. But it meant something. It meant something. There are things that we are doing prophetically that people are doing. And instead of judging it, we honor it. 
because we might not always know why they are doing the things they are doing, but their prophetic act might be the breakthrough you're going to walk in years later. Their prophetic obedience might be what your children are going to so freely walk in without even realizing the price and the cost of that. And so when Holy Spirit starts speaking to us, start unblocking the well, start taking stones, throw it out, it feels crazy. You question yourself. You're like, Holy Spirit, what is this? But then, then you realize what I am digging up now is so that the next generation can build on it. What I am doing now matters. It is part of his story, not our story. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. It's not about us. This is not our story, and we're trying to build our legacy. It's his story. It's his legacy, and we get to be part of that. We get to partner with that. We get to break things open with him. There is such power in that. It's not to take our walk lightly. It means something. It really means something. So my question for you tonight what foundation are you laying for the next generation? I'm running hard. I'm going to go after absolutely everything he has for me. The table he has prepared for me, I am going to devour it. <laughs> Catch me. Catch me. My ceiling is very high. I'm going to look like a fool for Jesus. I don't care. Because at the end of the day, he is the only thing that matters. Advancing the kingdom is the only thing that matters. Getting the lost saved is the only thing that matters. Getting the sick healed is the only thing that matters. Getting people set free from demons is the only thing that matters. My dignity means nothing compared to what he went through. You couldn't get more undignified what our Jesus had to go through. Naked on a cross. We put a loincloth on him. He's naked on the cross. Beaten spat at a crown of thorns pushing into his head and it's bleeding he's saying I'm thirsty they give him vinegar mocking him but he asks me to take a stone out of a bucket and I'm like what are people going to think of me but I'm running guys and I am putting my ceiling very high so that your floor starts there. And then you take it further. I can only take it that far. But then you take over and you build on my ceiling. And you learn from me. Don't reinvent the wheel. There are people even in this room that have walked through marriage things, that has walked through intercession, that has walked through the prophetic, that has been through life with Jesus by their sides. There are people here with such deep wells of wisdom. You don't have to do a new thing. He does a new thing. Not you. He does a new thing. You will save so much time and energy going to those that have gone before you than trying to work it out yourself in your own strength. There is a reason why there is multiple generation upon generation upon generation. We get
forget to build on their ceilings. What foundation are you laying? Make it hard for the youth. Let them look at you and be like, they are running so hard, I need to get there. What are they following? Are they seeing what you're doing? Do they know what you're pursuing? Do they know what you're going after? And then for the youth, are the Sunday school kids looking at you and saying, those guys are loving Jesus, they are running hard. Set your ceilings high, but run hard for him. Run hard for him. It's all in his strength. You see what I love about that scripture in Genesis. See, even though Isaac started redigging the wells that the enemy tried to block up, well, the enemy did block it up, and it took that generation to start unblocking it again. There's this little part in that scripture where it says that Isaac found streams of water. That's the newness. There are things that this next generation are going to discover that I will never see. But I'm so excited because we're all part of the same story. We all have the same goal. But let's not waste our time we have here. The reality is we do just have a short amount of time to advance the kingdom. Then I'm going to one day be with Jesus and I'll be so happy. I've got a short amount of time in my life to do as much damage to the enemy's camp that I can. Do not take your salvation for granted. And so even this week, I want you to really think, spend time with Holy Spirit and ask him, what is the foundation that you are building for the next generation? It's so worth it, guys. And so Holy Spirit, tonight I just pray pray that you will give us the boldness of a prophet Ezekiel that will not be scared to look like a fool for you, Jesus. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will stir our hearts afresh tonight. Just like Keegan preached this morning, I pray that you will increase our zeal for you again. Stir our hearts for you, Jesus. Let us run hard for you. Let us never take our eyes off you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen.